Hello friends and fools and all else who don't fall under the scope of this reductive false dichotomy. Today we're adding our take to the most difficult bosses in the Elden Ring DLC to the ever-expanding annals of this singular topic. And because there are already 20 of these videos being posted every 10 minutes, we decided to do it a little bit different. With math! And so I gathered over 30 different rankings all over the internet, from sources like gaming websites and forums, to Reddit threads and YouTube videos, gave them all a number value, and aggregated the data to provide one list that is based on much more than our singular opinion. If you want to avoid spoilers, then go away, I don't know why you clicked on this video. Okay, let's start. All right, let's talk about this water potato that's driving everybody up the wall. The Golden Hippopotamus, a massive and ancient beast, is a living remnant of the Crucible's vitality from an era long before darkness fell over the land. This puddle pig is not just a formidable opponent due to its sheer size and strength, but also because it embodies the raw power of the Crucible itself. The Blubber Buffalo's bristling, thorn-like fur manifests as a deadly weapon, capable of scouring the battlefield as it rolls, crushing anything in its path. Its connection to the Crucible allows it to channel the ancient force, unleashing devastating attacks that can overwhelm even the most prepared fighters. As it phases, the Chonkopotamus' attacks grow in power and range. The lore speaks of it as a symbol of the flourishing life force that once existed before the Shadow, and in its presence, you witness the terrifying remnants of that ancient era. His grab move? absolute nightmare. The timing is so awkward that it feels like BS trying to dodge it, and if that's not bad enough, you're stuck fighting this mud marshmallow in a tiny arena, which is just asking for trouble. With him constantly sweeping from side to side, half the time you can't even see what the hell's going on. Honestly, that feels like a design flaw, but regardless, it does make this glorified beanbag a lot tougher to fight. The Skadoo Tree is the shadow of the Ur Tree, quite literally, and it was born of dark thoughts that bear no sense of order. This darkness twisted and bent its stalk, and the Skadoo Tree avatar is a monstrous manifestation of this Skadoo Tree, taking the form of a withered sunflower. These weaponized weeds emerged in the wake of the Shattering and were created to protect the Ur Tree's offspring, aka minor Ur Trees. This pessimistic petal dancer has three phases, and by three phases I mean two times that he feigns death, providing you with a false sense of victory, before he comes back to life like Obi-Wan, even more powerful than before. If you're running a melee build, then this twisted version of Plants vs. Zombies will result in an uncontrollable urge to torture Grandma's flower garden. Speaking of fire, if you're running a caster build that deals fire damage, then your experience with this spiteful sprout will be quite different. His fire resistance is negative 40, and he takes 50% more damage to his flower head, making him significantly easier if you approach him with fire spells. Compare that to melee builds that typically have to hit the sunflower's base, which takes 66% less damage on top of his minor, but still present physical resistances, and it seems pretty obvious how this situation should be approached. The most difficult part of the fight for many is phase 3, when he uses a charge holy explosion that usually just one-shots you and is extremely difficult to dodge. My recommendation? Reroll faith and torch this herbaceous hazard before you lose your mind to a sunflower. Romina, saint of the bud, and not the good kind, is a tragic and powerful figure deeply connected to the Scarlet Rot. Once, in a crumbling, burning church, she discovered a twisted divine element that she wove into the rot itself, transforming it into a weapon. Her signature weapon, the pole blade of the bud, is a scarlet glaive that builds up rot with each strike, born from a bud that she held in silence. In her grief and transformation, Romina became the saint of the rot, embodying the destructive beauty of the scarlet buds that continued to flourish amidst the ruin. The problem with this pestilent priestess is that it's hard to know which of her many appendages is going to hit you, and virtually all of her attacks build up Scarlet Rot. However, if you're like me, you first approached her as melee and just stood by her side, not realizing that this is kind of a blind spot for her moves and this fight felt way easier than it probably did for some others. She, like others on this list, spent a lot of time moving around the field and making it difficult to land hits and extending the fight. Extending the fight in this case means more damage from Scarlet Rot, which can lead to an eventual downfall if you decided to pace yourself. This boss's difficulty is probably the most polarized that I found online, because people either body her in the first couple of tries or claim that this Wiggly Witch was even more difficult than Mesmer. The Divine Beast Dancing Lion was once a revered guardian, a symbol of divine power and fury. In ancient times, these majestic creatures were honored through sacred rituals, where their strength and connection to the heavens were celebrated with a lion dance. But when Mesmer's army descended upon the tower, the ritual took on a darker purpose. This dance, once a graceful invocation of the divine, became a weapon of war, channeling the beast's stormy wrath against its enemies. The divine beast dancing lion, once a messenger of the skies, was twisted into a force of destruction, its legacy forever marked by the battles it was forced to fight. The fight against the dancing lion is pure chaos. This twister kitten is all about versatility and unpredictability, making it tough to land a hit while dodging its various attacks. It can summon tornadoes that take over the battlefield, so you're constantly on the move, barely getting a moment to breathe. And just to keep you on your toes, Cyclone Simbo will constantly change his affinity, throwing out standard, strike, magic, frostbite, and lightning damage throughout the fight. Personally, I didn't find this Gale Force Garfield all that challenging, but I found the one that you face in the ruins of Rao to be the true challenge. My advice? Go for stance breaks. It's super easy if you have heavy weapons, and don't forget to summon Muscle Mommy Redmane Freya for additional stance damage. 
Meteor, Mother of Fingers, is a haunting figure in the Lands Between, known as the progenitor of all Two Fingers and Finger Creepers. Once a radiant daughter of the Greater Will, Meteor fell to the Lands Between as a shooting star, only to become a symbol of corruption and decay. Her body, twisted into a grotesque form, is used as a weapon, with her wrinkled fingerhead gazing vacantly into the beyond. Meter's staff, fashioned from her tail fingers, serves as a catalyst for both sorceries and incantation, channeling the broken hopes she once held as she awaited messages from the greater will that never came. Now, Meter stands as a tragic and unhinged figure, embodying the twisted fate of those who once held divine purpose. Straight up, this cuticle catastrophe is an all-around mess of a fight. Her first phase has people rage quitting over its jump attacks, which makes it seem like you should dodge when it lands, but instead you have to dodge its head that slams down after it lands. This Finger Blaster 5000 can also shoot laser beams out of its toe face and Pinky promises black holes out of its butt fingers. Meter, the mother of all Manny Petties, does have a weak spot though. She is slightly weaker to slash damage and she takes 50% more damage if she's hit in her belly. That discolored mess in front of her that is made out of, you guessed it, fingers. The Putrescent Knight is a twisted being born from the rot of tainted flesh, reanimated by St. Trina's Nectar. This guy is all about decay, wielding a massive cleaver made from hardened putrescence and human bone. Once upon a time, death was consumed by ghost flame, and even the impure remains of the dead were given this fiery end. But some of this putrescence lingered, seeping from the stone coffins that drifted underground. The putrescent knight fight is a perfect example of what frustrates players in Elden Ring. First off, the ratio between the time he spends attacking you and the tiny windows you get to attack back is completely off. You can barely land a hit before your buffs wear off, making it feel pointless to even use them. Then there's his habit of running around the arena much like the Elden Beast, wasting your time with long combos full of delayed attacks and guard breaks. But even the Elden Beast gives you more time to chip away at him. You can break his stance, but again, that requires that you constantly hit him, and it's kind of difficult. And let's not forget about the plunge into the boss arena after you've died. Every time, you're basically saying goodbye to your runes. It's a massive, dimly lit space where finding them is like searching for a needle in a haystack, especially if you died in a terrible spot. You may as well kiss those runes goodbye because finding them again is an exercise in pure frustration. All in all, this gooey gladiator is just objectively frustrating and a major test of patience. That being said, we did use the wave of gold ash of war from the sacred relic sword and a shield with no skill in the offhand, and honestly, we didn't have too much of a problem with this boss. Midra is the embodiment of chaos and destruction, known as the Lord of the Frenzied Flame. He is a twisted figure corrupted by the power of the Frenzied Flame, a force that drives its victims into madness and ruin. Midra was once a noble warrior, but he was succumbed to the lure of the Frenzied Flame, which granted him immense power at the cost of his sanity. Fair trade. Midra's first phase is laughable. He's just a half-dead corpse that you get to take out in a couple of hits, clearly designed to give you a false sense of security. Although sometimes he jump grabs you and it's really annoying, you feel really bad and you want to restart. But then, things take a hard turn into nightmare territory. Midra rips the sword out of his face, replacing it with a maddening orb, and that's when the real fight begins. Suddenly, you're dodging fiery waves and dealing with those intentionally delayed melee attacks that Frame Software loves to torment us with. Just when you think you've got a handle on things, Midra cranks the chaos up to 11. He starts throwing out Kamehameha beams of pure madness that one-shot you if your defenses aren't up to par. The easiest way to dodge his mechanics is to die immediately and never come back because he's optional. What's probably the most difficult component of the fight is the madness buildup, which does an absurd amount of damage and leaves you wide open for his relentless attacks, often resulting in immediate death. Midra's second phase is where nightmares are born, and it's designed to make sure you never forget it. Commander Gaius, known as the Wild Boar Rider, was a legendary Albaneric warrior who forged an unbreakable bond with a massive boar. Though he couldn't wear the black iron greaves made for him, Gaius mastered gravity-manipulating sorcery, pulling blade-like rocks from the earth, a skill born from a rivalry with Rodan. As Mesmer the Impaler's close friend and trusted leader of his forces, Gaius's fierce spirit and unmatched resolve made him a figure of an enduring legend, despite the curse that he carried from birth. My first time taking on this boar jockey wasn't too bad, thanks to my tank build. But when I switched to a dodge-dependent approach, things got ugly fast, and I understand why he's so high on the list. Dodging his attacks turned out to be way trickier than I expected, and figuring out the timing was a nightmare. You can hide behind the wall to dodge some of his AoE attacks, but staying close to that wall often leads you to wondering what the hell is going on. Plus, this piggybacked powerhouse has a knack for keeping his distance, which drags the fight out way longer than you'd like, cranking up the difficulty even more, in my opinion. Just a nice warm-up for Radon. Curse you, Bale! Bale the Dread is one of the most fearsome ancient dragons in the lore. This beast wasn't just about raw power, he wielded flame lightning, a terrifying force drawn straight from his still beating heart. Bale once went head to head with Dragon Lord Placenta Saxes himself, and although both were left horribly wounded, Bale's heart kept fighting, never giving up. That relentless power is what makes Bale so iconic. Even after his defeat, his heart became the source of some of the most devastating dragon communion incantations. This dragon wasn't just strong, he was defiant to the end, and even now the power in his heart is so intense that anyone who tries to harness it risks being consumed by its fury. Once you enter Bale 
Gale's Arena, you have approximately 0.01 seconds to respond before getting knocked off your feet. Thinking about using spirit summons out of sheer desperation? Well, good luck with that. Instead of having a few precious seconds to start the fight, you're going to have to figure out how and when to summon mid-fight, which is no easy task. You can also bring in Eigen to help, but his summon sign is hidden kind of in the arena and it's hard to see. And here's the kicker. You can only target the boss's head, which is a nightmare if you're running a melee build because hitting it is nearly impossible, although he does take slightly more damage on his wounded leg. Plus, if you're up close, his sweeping attacks and fire breath will punish you constantly. But here's the silver lining. His massive hitbox makes him vulnerable to spells in certain Ashes of War. We found that Pest Thread Spears are insanely effective, tearing through his body, triggering successive attack buffs, and dealing ridiculous amounts of damage as they pierce through his body and reach his head. It's honestly one of the most satisfying ways to take him down, if you can manage. Just set up behind Bale's buttocks and send those serrated spears straight up his ass. Rolana, known as the Twin Moon Knight, is a former priestess of the Carrion family. She is the younger sister of Ranala, Queen of the Full Moon. Rolana renounced her birthright to stand by Mesmer, fully aware that even the moon's brilliance couldn't save them. Her unwavering loyalty earned her the title Sword of Mesmer. Rolana is an absolute nightmare to deal with. Her blades are infused with both fire and magic, so having a high defense won't necessarily save you here. She hits you with a deadly combo of slash and pierce damage, but it doesn't stop there. She also dishes out two types of non-physical damage that can cut right through your armor. Just know that when this bipolar blade master reveals her astrology sign, she's about to go retrograde all over your face. The likely reason she ranks so high on the difficulty list is that she's often the first boss you face in the Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC. From Software loves to humble players right out of the gate, and Rolana is no exception. Plus, the Shadow of the Erdtree DLC introduces an upgrade currency called Scatter Tree Fragments that boosts your damage dealt and reduce the damage you take, but this early in the game, you probably haven't gathered many of these, if any at all, depending on how much you've explored. This makes Rolana absurdly punishing for anybody who isn't fully prepared. Mesmer the Impaler was a powerful warrior cursed from birth. His mother, fearing the dark serpent inside of him, I don't know how it got up there, took out his eye and sealed it with grace to control his power. But her fear led her to hide him away in the realm of shadow, where his anger only grew stronger. Mesmer's inner fire, which he hated but couldn't escape, made him a force of destruction. He led a group called the Black Knights, but even they turned against him when they learned of his true nature. Among his few remaining allies was Rolana, who gave up her royal status to fight by his side. In the end, Mesmer broke the seal his mother placed on him, fully embracing the cursed power within. His life was defined by torment and a fire that he could never extinguish. Have you ever met a troubled bully and you clearly see that they weren't hugged enough as a child? Well, that's pretty much Mesmer. Mesmer is one of those fights that keeps you on your toes from start to finish. His unpredictable attacks and brutal flame strikes make it hard to find a safe moment to counter. The constant barrage of fire and AoE attacks can quickly overwhelm you, especially if you're not careful with your positioning. And just when you think you've got him figured out, he shatters the sealed eye, unleashing his full power. In this phase, his attacks become more chaotic and deadly, with faster, more powerful flame attacks that cover a larger area. Promised Consort Radon at number 1, perhaps the most expected part of this video. Radon, the Promised Consort, isn't just any demigod. He's a legend in the Lands Between. His title Consort means that he was seen as a destined companion to Mikola. Radon mastered gravity magic for several reasons, but the main reason is because he wanted to keep riding his beloved horse Leonard, who unfortunately isn't part of this epic battle in the DLC. However, this isn't the version of Radon we see in the base game. No, this is Radon in his prime, before space leprosy drove this anime powerlifter to madness. He uses a relentless assault of gravity-based fighting combos to punish you for thinking you could play video games and relax after a long day of work. Eventually, this dad-defeating superhuman gets a message from Mikola to take out the trash, and that's when Radon snaps into his second phase. Now taking on the form of Space Jesus, he unleashes the powers of two demigods to induce a rage-baiting fight that results in the player uninstalling Elden Ring. Honorable mentions to Needle Knight Leta and company, the gang of ever-loyal hooligans that lust for an unfair advantage, the Black Jail Knight, an introductory boss with the artillery of Tug Speedman, Senesax, disguised as just another ancient dragon field boss but has killed so many people that he may as well have his own remembrance, and demi-human Swordmaster Anzi, resembling Jedi Master Curious George, and whose name means 11 in French, all of whom couldn't make it here today, but they are still here in our hearts. And that settles, once and for all, the top 12 hardest bosses in the DLC. You can comment below on what you struggled on and where you disagree, but I won't listen because I've been living in a hyper-polarized, angry, reddit thread echo chamber for the last week, and so I will reject all opinions that don't reaffirm my own beliefs. I hope you like this video, and we are really curious, where do you feel base game bosses like Millennia and Malekith would be placed if they were included in this list? Anyway, this is the first video we've done like this, so if you like it, please let us know. Thank you, bye.